Hello, and welcome to Crew Call, the Below the Line podcast by, for, and about the crew. Today, I'm speaking with a camera assistant and author of the Black and Blue blog. Please welcome Evan Luzi. 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 Got it right. <laughs> so let me start out with your background. Um, when did you get started in the business? So I got started in 2009. Um, I was actually still in college, and I was looking for a summer job, ideally in the film world. And in Virginia, where I live, that's not so easy to come by for a uh, 20-year-old. But I happened to be reading a uh, NFL player, Chris Cooley, who played for the Washington Redskins, had posted something on his blog about how he was greenlighting a local movie being made. So I looked up the production company, found out they were based about 30 minutes away from me, and emailed the CEO of the company and said, I'll do whatever it takes to get on the set. You know, the the old Hollywood pitch, like, I'll work for free, I'll sweep the floors. (laughs) Nice. So what did you start uh, as? I got my resume on to the production manager. Uh, shortly after, they asked me what what department I would want to be in. Um, I said camera. I was lucky enough that they placed me in the camera department. And when I showed up on the prep day, I found out that there was only the DP and the first AC and me. And that was the camera department. Um so technically, I was the camera PA, but by the end of the prep day, I quickly became the second AC. And I worked the whole feature as the second AC, and at the end of it, the first AC was impressed with what I had done. And ever since then, I've been still in the camera department. It was kind of one of those situations where I, I really lucked out on that first job. Now, did you have have you ever done anything else, or just just stayed specifically just camera? Uh yeah, I've I've stayed only in the camera department. You know, I've done things like um, I've swung in departments where technically I'm there for camera, but I'm helping out. I've been the only crew member with just the camera operator, so also doing grip and electric work. But I've never explicitly been hired into a, another department, not even as a as a general PA. So tell me, what is a camera assistant's job from like the beginning till, you know, like the beginning of your day until the end of the day? Sure. So the pitch, the one line that I always tell people when I have to explain what a camera assistant is, because you can imagine it comes up a lot at parties and family events, is that you have the DP or the cinematographer who is the creative head of the camera department, and then you have the camera assistant, who is the technical head of the camera department. So if the the director of photography is worrying about lighting and composition, the camera assistant is in charge of making sure that the lenses are clean, that there's enough film in the camera or enough space on the memory card, that the batteries are charged, that all the equipment um, that gets put on the camera or that the camera department has to use is in working order. Um, we're also in charge of pulling focus and slating, um, camera reports, and checking out camera equipment from the rental house and making sure it gets back to them in one piece or two pieces maybe sometimes. Um, so on a typical day, I'll arrive and immediately start trying to find a staging area for all of our camera equipment. I'll unload the camera cart, uh, whatever gear cases we have, and take it to that staging area and start building the camera. So while other people might be eating breakfast or grabbing coffee, usually I like to build the camera because I know as soon as the DP, the director, the first AD, after they have their coffee, they're going to want to start setting up, and it's vital that the camera is ready to go at that point. So maybe while I'm building the camera, I'm eating a muffin or a banana or whatever. But that's that's priority number one is to get it built. Uh, sometimes it's faster if you're in a studio situation or what we call a walkaway, where you've been shooting the night before and you can leave the camera partially built. And then that way we come in. It's just a matter of getting the right lenses on, powering everything up, getting the batteries charged. Um, so once the camera is built, I'll let the DP know uh, either by bringing 
set or alerting him that it's ready to be brought to set whenever he has an idea of what the first shot would be. Uh, sometimes the camera department has to stay out of the way of the grip and electric guys while they get all their stuff set up. So once the camera's on set and everybody can see the frame, uh, things can start moving pretty quickly. And what a camera assistant does can differ based if, on if you're the first camera assistant or the second camera assistant. Um, a typical day in the first AC means living by the camera a lot to be the right-hand man of the director of photography or the camera operator. Uh, the first AC is also in charge of pulling focus, which is to say that they are manually adjusting the focus barrel on the lens to keep the talent or whatever subject in the frame in focus. Um, so once the camera's on set, man, I'm there until we break for lunch. Uh, as long as the camera is doing something in the scene, then I'm on my feet and I'm working next to it. So we'll shoot until lunch. Sometimes if there's a problem with the camera, I'm working through lunch. Um, or maybe downloading some footage during lunch. And then after that, it's just a sprint to the end of the day. We wrap out and try to prep anything for the next day, making sure that it's ready to go for tomorrow. Now, does this mean that you know what's coming up, the shots that are coming up? Are they, do they give you a list, you know, the day before, just so you know when you come to work, um, what's going on? Or is it something that they tell you when you arrive, okay, we're doing this, this, and this? Do you have any kind of input on what you're going to do, or is that the, you know, your boss telling you, okay, I want you to do this? That's a good question. Um, usually I have a general idea of what's going to be happening based on the call sheet and on some occasions or read a script for a short film, just so I do have an idea of when they talk about, when I can hear the DP and the director talk about a scene, I can sort of get an idea of how it's going to be shot. Um, I like when a DP has a shot list because that makes my job a lot easier because uh, I can show up and know, all right, we are shooting two close-ups on both the main talent and a wide. And so I can put on what I think the DP, what lens I think the DP wants for the wide and sort of have on in my mind on standby the lenses I know he prefers for close-up coverage. Um, but I wouldn't say it's that way all the time. And it's, it's more of a general idea. And I do, when I'm hired for a job, tend to ask the DP, are we going to be shooting handheld? Are we going to be shooting off a tripod stick most of the time? And I'll even ask those questions at the end of the day for the next day. So at the end of the day, the day I might say, okay, so what's in store for tomorrow? And I might just ask them for the big ticket items, you know, like what are the big shots that I need to know about to, mentally prepare myself and get my department ready to go for when those pop up. Okay. Um, so now let's get back to the focusing and all those things. Um, what type of focus pulls are, are surprisingly difficult to perform and which ones might be easier than people expect? Hmm. They're all kind of difficult in their own way. Um, but I think some of the most difficult focus poles are animals, uh, just because they're harder to predict what they're going to do. As a focus pole, you, uh, you get used to watching people and sort of learning what tendencies they have before they might take a step to the right or lean forward. And you get very good at reading that and anticipating that. But animals, like cats, dogs, what have you, it's, that's all thrown out the window. They just can go wild. Um, they also aren't very good at hitting marks all the time. The other thing, when actors or actresses are getting in and out of chairs, especially if the camera is tilting up or down uh, following them, just because there's so many subtle changes of distance there, You'll find a lot of people when they get out of a chair will lean forward and then they'll stand up. And so you have this, and it's a very quick motion a lot of the time. And so you have this very dramatic change in distance uh, going from close to far away. And you just have like these three or four different marks that you usually have to hit very quickly. So that's one that's surprisingly difficult. Uh, the 
easy ones, I find, you know, obviously if you're on a wide lens, you have really wide depth of field and the camera's not moving. It's like, great, let's just sit here and count to 10 while we record. But in terms of easy ones that people may think are difficult, I think tracking shots, if you have a good operator, uh, don't prove to be that difficult all the time uh, because a good operator will be very talented at uh, keeping the same distance between them and the actor or actress that they're following. Uh, So it's usually just very subtle adjustments of the focus. Um, That can be a tough shot if you have an operator who is not very good at keeping that same distance just because you're continually looking at where the camera is versus where the talent is. And anytime you have the camera moving and the subject moving, it's going to be a much, much harder shot than uh, one thing static. Action is perhaps a little bit easier, and that may seem counterintuitive, but motion blur can help sort of cover up any uh, fuzzy focus. So you get a little reprieve during the moments where maybe a punch is swung against another actor or something like that. You get a moment to land on your mark. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I do have a pretty funny story, though, about a difficult focus pull. So the first job I was ever on as a first AC, and I was just sort of, I don't remember what I was doing, but I was messing with the camera, like going through the menus, just making sure everything was as it was supposed to be. And I remember looking up from my monitor, and all of a sudden all the crew were just no longer around. And I turned to the DP and I said something like, where did everybody go? And then I heard the first AD announce that it was a closed set. And I had no idea what we were shooting. I I had just been told to set up the camera here, point it this direction, and I was sort of waiting for a rehearsal. Well, this also happened to be during magic hour, which is that 15 minutes of light that is actually more like five minutes and that everybody panics that you have to get the shot. So we're not going to get a rehearsal because the light's perfect, it's magic hour, and the sun's setting, and they really need to start rolling. So I'm told to just get the camera ready to roll, and as I'm doing that, I look out of the corner of my eye, and our lead actress is disrobing. So we're in front of a pool, (laughs) and apparently the scene was that she was skinny dipping, swims towards the camera, gets up out of the pool, and goes and meets our lead actor. So now I knew why it was a closed set, because we had this nude actress standing just off (laughs) off camera. And then I find out she's going to swim towards the camera. We're wide open on the lens, so my depth of field, of course, is, you know. And so she swims towards the camera, and I try my best. I kind of buzzed it. I was still pretty inexperienced at that time. And... By the time we had gotten through, I think, two takes, the light had gone. But I'll never forget, as soon as she got her robe back on, the set was opened back back up, the key grip came up to me and kind of had this smirk on his face. And he looked at me and like, he's like, hey, hey, how did she look in the pool, huh? And I would turn to him and I was like, I'll be honest with you, man. I have no idea because I was so worried about pulling focus that I just didn't even catch a look at anything. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of actors and actresses, um, how much interaction do you have with them? Do you do anything with them, or do you, do they even do you have any kind of direction with them, or that's all handled with the director and someone else? Um, you have some interaction with the cast. Uh, it really depends on the shoot. On the smaller shoots, the low budget stuff, of course. Everything's more like a family, and you get to know them more. On the sort of bigger budget stuff, generally I try and stay out of the way of the actors. They've already got, (laughs) they're dealing with their own things. They have the director directing them. Sometimes the DP is giving them blocking instructions. Um, But it's hard not to interact with them sometimes. Um, When I'm getting focus marks or I'm pulling my tape measure, and I have to get right next to them and get it near their eyes or something like that. Um, before I do that, I'll introduce myself. I'll just say something like, hey, I'm Evan. I'm the camera assistant. Do you mind if I just get a quick mark real fast? 
as a second AC, I feel like you can interact with the cast more just because you have to do things like slating and sometimes you're slating right in front of their face and you're sitting there and you're waiting for the camera to roll and, you know, you can have a little small talk with them or they'll mess with you. Um, sometimes they like to slate themselves, so you teach them how to do it. You're also marking tape at their feet, so it's kind of an awkward thing if you don't acknowledge that you're there. If you Like, I've tried to sneak in and just lay a mark and then they'll, like, step on my fingers or something like that and panic. So while I try and limit the interactions, it's usually better just to introduce yourself, get it out of the way, and then they understand that you're doing a job, too. Okay. Um, But it's also important to know the mood of the scene. So when is it appropriate to talk to an actor? Uh, Yeah. There's one shoot I was on where we were filming the end of the, this movie where the lead actor is about to die or something like that. And uh, I remember I was having a conversation with him and then there was sort of a lull in our conversation that I looked over and he had like tears coming out of his eyes because he had just gotten into his mood for um, the scene we were shooting. And I asked him, yeah, I asked him later that night, about it, and he said that he had been thinking about how he had just gotten divorced and all these feelings had just welled up inside of him. So in those situations, I certainly try and stay out of the way. And right. I've seen, you know, all the crew kind of have to be like that. Um, I was filming something once where there's a couple in bed, and it was a scene that's supposed to be pretty intimate. Um, she was in sort of a nightgown and he was shirtless and we were doing the rehearsal and it went very well. It was a very intense scene. Everybody was very hushed. And at the end of it, the director made some joke about the actor's nipples. (laughs) It was wild. It was so wildly inappropriate. You could just tell that it just like sucked the air out of the room. And I think, um, the scene may have been worse off for that. But that just sort of illustrates how the mood of the crew can sort of influence uh, the ability for the actors to get into their moment. And at the end of the day, the actors are the whole reason we're setting up the lights and the cameras and all that. Right, most definitely. I tend to, I love sitting with the actors and talking to them about what they've worked on. Many of them are friendly during lunch. Um, I worked on a movie where Tate Donovan went out and bought us a bunch of pizza after we had wrapped, so you got in my good book for that. (laughs) Right? Food. Food is always good. Yeah, another actor (laughs) bought the whole camera department pictures of beer, so if you want to get on our good side, if any talent are listening, you want to get on camera department's good side, (laughs) pictures of beer and pizza, that'll do it. So now... How is working in Los Angeles different from Washington or anywhere else that you've been? Is it any different or is it pretty much the same? Um, I think I've worked in L.A., so I can't speak to that explicitly. I can speak to some of the uniqueness of shooting in D.C. I think there's probably less studio environments than there are in L.A. It's a lot more on-location okay. stuff. I think there's also a lot more hassle of film permits. Um, D.C. is pretty notorious yeah. for this because all of our monuments sometimes have multiple jurisdictions of different police forces. Um, so we, there's the Capitol Police. There's also the National Park Service, which you have to get permits through them. Then there's also the D.C. Police. So depending where you're trying to shoot, you may have a permit from one um precinct and not have it from the other and the other one that didn't give you the permit might hassle you or something like that. So I think that's pretty unique to DC. And they're a lot more sensitive to cameras, as you can imagine, just because everybody's suspicious of everybody. Um, Mm -hmm. They want to make sure you're not filming to, you know, plan some terrorist attack or something like that. Not that if you were going to do it, you would roll up with a grip truck or something like that, but still. (laughs) Yeah, then yeah, the security is going to be tougher, I guess, out there than it would be somewhere else. They're just a lot more suspicious, I think, at the start of. Well, yeah. 
Now, has anything changed in the industry since you started? Or is it still kind of the same? Is there any, like, technology that has changed that's made it easier or harder? Certainly. And basically, as an AC, I've grown with um, digital cinematography. Um, And in some ways, it's making our jobs easier compared to the camera assistants who grew up in the film days. We have better monitoring. Mm -hmm. I think digital loading is easier than film loading. Um, you know, it's easier to pop a memory card in than it is to load in a changing bag. Um, and I think that is a, there's less barrier to entry uh, to come in at the low end of the camera department because of that. Familiar to people of my generation who sort of grew up with, you know, I grew up making mm-hmm. movies off home camcorders that shot digitally and everything like that. So some of the, the digital things that we've grown up with are just familiar to us. In terms of making it harder, I think software isn't easy as, isn't as easy to fix as mechanical issues. You know, if a film camera breaks, you might be able to take some tools to it or some oil and repair it. But if, you know, a Red One camera, like has happened to me, you just starts going into time lapse mode randomly. You know, you, you can't undo the circuit yeah. board and like resolder it or, You can't go in and mess with the source code of the camera. You're sort of just beholden to that camera's quirks or to send it back to whoever manufactured it. Yeah, I guess that would be the downfall of technology is that the harder it is to fix if something goes wrong. Yeah, exactly. So you're putting a lot of trust into the camera manufacturer, and that's such a bad rap early on is because though they were making so many things easier, in the digital world, they were also, you know, if you had a problem with one, you were kind of screwed. You kind of, you had to get a new one, and if your rental house didn't have a new one available, then you just kind of had to work around it. I also think mm-hmm. that DSLRs have risen to pretty big prominence since I've been in the industry, and as a camera assistant, that's made my job a little bit more difficult, because these are stills cameras that you're putting into uh, cinematic uses. And for pulling focus, especially, it's kind of a nightmare. You don't, on cinema lenses, you may have uh, what's called witness marks that tell you uh, where the focus is at, you know, three feet, three feet, six inches, four feet, five feet, that kind of thing. On a lot of still lenses, you may have witness marks. They're really tiny on the top of the lens, so they're hard to read. And they may go from like 20 feet to two feet. And they may mm-hmm. only be, you know, a, the, the tiniest turn of the follow focus goes from 20 feet to two feet. And these are lenses that are meant to operate on autofocus from the camera, from the stills camera. So that's made uh, camera assisting a little bit more difficult. And I think just digital in general has caused an industry attitude of less rehearsals. Um, mm-hmm. which means less time for ACs to get marked um, and learn where they need to be focusing in a scene. And then the other part of digital that I've seen is just, there's just so many more cameras now, and they're coming out every year. You know, I'm heading to NAB this year, and I'm sure there's going to be at least five new cameras that inevitably I may have to learn and read their manuals so there's just a lot more information out there to digest. So basically, you have to be more skilled now because you have to keep on educating yourself on the different hardware, software, different equipment, different technology. Well, I wouldn't say you have to be more skilled, but it's uh, you do have to always use these new cameras. And each new camera is having new technologies, so like Canon just announced in their... C300, C100, C500 line that they have like this new autofocus thing. So I haven't played with it yet, but that's something that I need to learn how to to operate and fix if it goes wrong. Um, Just because if I'm working with that camera and the DP or the cam off turns to me and asks to turn it on, I need to know everything about it to make sure that I can handle it appropriately. But I wouldn't say it's you have to be more skilled. Um, The skills are always going to be sort of the same. But 
in terms of just having raw information in your head, I think that has certainly increased. What would you suggest to someone who's just starting out and they don't have lady luck on their side and they want to <laughs> be a camera assistant? <laughs> what would you tell them or, you know, um, who do they need to know? What do they need to know? Should they do the same thing you did, just call up and talk to somebody? Or what, what do you suggest? Um, I mean, they can try the same thing I did. I can't promise results. <laughs> Retrospectively, I realize how lucky I am, but it never hurts to reach out to people and send your resume. And you know, what's the worst that happens? They say no, and you're in the same spot you're in before. So, right. That said, don't don't go out spamming people. Like, have a sincere interest in approaching them. But I think to someone just starting out and wants to be an AC, you should know the basics of cinematography at least. So you should know what depth of field is, what aperture is, shutter speed, ISO, no lighting terms, and how cameras work in principle. I mean, you don't have to know, like, the fine details of lens optics or anything like that. But certainly you should be able to have an educated discussion with the DP or know what he's saying when he asks for a P-stop of 2.8 or something like that. I also think the most important thing that, Anybody trying to get started in the film industry, not necessarily just as an AC, um, is just to be resourceful. Uh, you know, I know just as much as I do, sometimes you step on a set and you have no idea what the day has in store. And you have to adapt quickly. Um, right. Sets are such a pressure cooker and they can be very chaotic. So you have to be able to think on your feet really fast. And so when I'm hiring for a second AC or a camera PA, that's sort of what I like to look for in somebody is to see, you know, if I give them a task that they they maybe weren't prepared for, can they just do it anyway and figure it out as they go along? So be a little proactive. Is there anything else that you would um, want in a PA or an assistant? Uh, like I said, just to be resourceful. Um, I wrote on my website about a thing that I call the, the PA paradox, which is that PAs are often expected to be able to do anything, but they're sometimes treated as if they don't know how to do anything. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, they can be chided for being too eager and then later in the day be, you know, hammered for being lazy or not doing enough. Um, and I think the way to counter that and what's very important in a lot of PAs is just to be available. So be standing near the set, not in the way, but in a in a position where if somebody needs your help, they can turn, you know, just off the set and say, hey, you, can you help me lug these sandbags? Or can you go just move that C-stand a little bit? And then also introduce yourself, offer help, but don't necessarily assume that they need help. A lot of crew can get frustrated with PAs if they uh, just start doing something. I, I think it's much mm. more tactful if you just walk up to somebody you think needs help and say, hey, can I help you out with that? And if they say yes, mm-hmm. jump in. If they say no, then, you know, realize that maybe they have some system that they that they really don't need help or they don't want it because they can mess it up. Evan, if you were the king of Hollywood and you could change anything, what would you like to do differently? Uh, is, this a, is this one thing, or can I have many decrees as king? You could have many decrees as king, anything you want. <laughs> All right. Number one, I think I'd pay crew more, right? Can, I like that Everybody one. can get on board with that one. i pay crew <laughs> more and pay them fairly, which I know... Everybody gets paid fair at the top end of the scale, but working the low budget stuff, man, sometimes you're working for peanuts. So yeah. I would decree everybody gets paid more on those gigs. The other thing I would do on a serious note is support the 12 on 12 off initiative that was started by mm-hmm. Haskell Wexler. Are you familiar with it? I sure am. Yeah. So I think that it's a really great idea to have 
uh, 12-hour turnarounds and 12-hour days and no more than six hours between meals. I think that's more than reasonable, and I think it's yeah. sort of crazy that we even have to argue for a 12-hour day. Um, I know. So I would like to see that become more of a reality. And I think the last thing I might do as King of Hollywood is abolish reboots. As a consumer <laughs> of movies, I'm tired of seeing reboots. So no more of those. It's reasonable, Evan. It's reasonable. Your decrees are reasonable. I like I'm them. the people's king. I'm the people's king. So what's the best part of your job? What do you like the best out of everything? Ooh. That's tough. I mean, I love I love AC work, and probably the reason I love it is because you you're always near the action. You know, there's you're not filming anything without a camera, and so I get to see all the cool stuff, like the story I mentioned earlier. Well, not necessarily that a naked woman is a cool thing to see, but <laughs> it is. But there's a lot of other cool things that I've seen. Um, and, and by working in the camera department, you were guaranteed a ticket to that show, you know? Like, uh, when mm-hmm. I worked as a camera PA, sometimes I have to step out of the room because it's too crowded, or I have to be at the camera car or something like that, so I don't get to see the cool stunt. But when you're first AC, it's, it's pretty awesome. Like, I've seen a guy lit on fire, like, I love squids and all that kind of cool stuff that really makes you feel like you're making a movie. That's probably my favorite part. It's just that I always get to be near the action. You get the front seat. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me and answering my list of questions, my laundry list. Um, Thank you very much. We appreciate you. And as your royal subject, I am going to say goodbye and thank you so much. (laughs) Uh, Thanks for having me. I had a great time. And that's it for this week's crew call. Big thanks again to Evan Luzai for telling us what it's like to be a camera assistant. Tune in next week for location manager Nathan Grenzier. Thanks for listening.